working order or how things fit together, how things uh, kind of create or are Uh, operate together in succinct uh, operation with one another. I think it's really powerful. It changes everything when we understand, I get how it works. Well, that's exactly what we're on a wonderful course of here at City of Light, learning how our spirituality works. For it works for us. It's very practical. It's very positive. It's there, and we want to understand how it can work on our behalf to take us to our highest and best. For our intention here on this earth is not meant to live a life of immense struggle and challenge and just say, oh, we try to work through it, but never knew how. Never knew how or understood how to live that successful life that's been offered to us. So as we study together, as we search, as we seek together, we're learning exactly how this thing called spirituality works works and how it works for us. Now, the Bible is a wonderful guide for our lives. It gives us immense instruction. Trouble is, many of us have a hard time understanding the instruction manual. We understand a little bit, but not enough as to really say, how does it fit together? How does this really work? What was the intention uh, for us to really put everything together in all the different pieces of a passage of Scripture or to understand the truth? So we're on this wonderful journey. Thank you so much for the questions that you're submitting. Today's question that we're looking at is kind of a culmination of several people who have been asking something quite similar, and it's this. The person said, fear, stress, and anxiety, it creeps into my life, and I often give in to it. I don't like living at this place. What can I do to eliminate these thoughts and emotions? Key question is, what can I do to eliminate, get rid of? It's not really about a journey about learning to live in fear, learning to live with fear, but learning to eliminate all fear from our lives. It's this wonderful experience that we're called to that says spirituality works in the essence that it removes all fear, takes it away. We actually can be fearless people. Now, Scripture tells us in story after story about fearless experiences or people have demonstrated a fearlessness within their lives. So this question that we're asking today, this composite question that's come from several people, is really one that's been down through the ages. It's not new. It's been for thousands of years, and the answer is there. It's been there in a timeless way. We find it written beautifully in an illustrated story in the book of Daniel. Come with me. Let's go to the book of Daniel, and let's make it come alive. It's the story of three men who were living fearlessly in a fear-based world. Now, that's like you and I, a world that's truly filled with fear all around us. Haven't you felt the fear in people's voices, these Facebook postings, their internet, their emails, their phone calls, their conversations? Haven't you felt some of the stress that people go through and the anxiety that's happening within their lives? We've all been there. Anyone lived a life that's free of stress, fear, or anxiety? Raise your hand. Okay, I think we're all in agreement that we know exactly what this is all about. As we go to this Bible story, we find these three people living that fearless life in a fear-based world. It's the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Now, when I was a little kid, I'd ask my mother, you know, would you, mom, would you tell me a bedtime story? It was really more so an excuse to say, I want to stay up a little later. I'm not really tired. I don't want to go to bed. And my mother says, yeah, I'll tell you a Bible story. Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. That's the story I'm telling you. Well, I want to make it clear. It's not to bed we go. It's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right? So when we look at these beautiful characters, these three lives, and the lesson that they bring for us, it unfolds a beautiful story for us. Number one, first, I want to note the beautiful symbolism in this story. Three key characters. Now, every time we're looking at the Scripture, one of the things that jumps at us is that writers use beautiful symbolism to convey deeper meanings. When we find the number three mentioned, or three in a story utilized in some way, it's that something greater is happening. There's a dynamic tension, or there's a power at work. So we think about the many threes that are in Scripture. 
We think about the Trinity itself. We may think about Jesus being resurrection in three days. We may think about all the different threes that are there that have been described in different ways, uh, three hours or three days, and, and all being written in for to add a nuance of symbolism to help to convey something deeper to the listener of the story. The writer wanted to use these beautiful numbers that help us engage in a depth of the metaphorical or the deeper meaning of a story itself. Three, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They were appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Okay, so Daniel had appointed them and put them in that you are the ones who are in charge and you are sort of the leaders in this realm of the government of that day and age. Now the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, big ego man, said, I've decided I'm going to create a fabulous statue out of gold. And I want everyone to bow. I want everyone to bow and worship this statue. And when you hear the music play, I want you all to bow. No matter what you're doing, stop what you're doing. When you hear the flutes, when you hear the harps, when you hear all these instruments coming together, this gorgeous music, what you need to do is stop whatever you're doing and bow. Worship. Give all honor. Give all your energy and attention to this uh, golden idol, this huge statue I've created. That statue really represents the consciousness of our want and need, of our materialism, and how often we find that in today's world it's no different. We're human beings who are facing statues, monuments, all kinds of things of this world of need and want that we're called to bow down to by society's pressures that say, you must, you must, you must. In fact, the king was so insistent, said, if you don't bow down, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. That's right. You're going to go into the fiery furnace. If you don't follow the music plays, you're not bowing down. Anyone standing up, get ready for this is your punishment. This is exactly what's going to happen. Wow, you can imagine this intense pressure. Pressure to do. Pressure to uh, be part of that mass consciousness of saying, oh, we all need to bow. Music playing, we all need to bow. Just go ahead and bow. Everyone just follow through and everyone just go through whatever everybody else is doing. Let's be part of it just the same. And there was this moment where the king brought these three, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and said, it's been pointed out to us that the three of you are not willing to bow. What's going on here? And so he tries to get them and engage them in this and saying, you know, do you realize the punishment? Do you realize the outcome? Do you realize what's going to happen to you? Are you not afraid? Are you not embodied with this whole spirit of anxiety, stress, and fear? Because you're not willing to participate with everybody else and go along with the mainstream and exactly what's been set out there for you? Do you don't realize this? Because you're going to fall into this wonderful place where you're now in captivity and thrown into the fiery furnace. Where does that kind of fear come from? Because the king was trying to instill it. The people, the community, the culture of that time, everybody was buying into it. Fear is that consciousness that kind of permeates and flows through our society, and it's passed on from one to another. Where does it come from? Sadly to say, a lot of our fear really comes from our religion. We learn fear from some of the theological bases that have been presented to us. A religion that says, if you don't bow, you'll burn. If you don't do this or that, you're going to be punished. We've heard that all through the ages, haven't we? All through our life, our time, down through the years. It's this kind of theological perspective that says, if you don't do exactly what you've been told, there's some sort of punishment coming your way. And it's always based on a worst case scenario, isn't it? It's never like, if you don't do this, something good's going to happen to you. No, if you don't do this, something bad's going to happen to you, right? It's always you're going to hell. Uh, isn't it interesting that we have a theological perspective that's offered by so many churches, spiritual communities, and religions that's always trying to point out you're going to hell instead of you're going to heaven? There's always the worst case scenario. It's built on a fear-based approach that's always inviting you to think the worst, live the worst, and because you come from thinking and living the worst, somehow you'll be manipulated to do the best. Isn't that kind of a crazy world that we might live in? That somehow we think fear is the great motivator when love 
is the great motivator. And all through the stories of the scripture have been inviting us to experience love, not fear. For God is love, right? We know that. God is love. The very energy, the very power, the very presence of love is what it is. And the invitation is for you to experience that and allow that wonderful love to fill you from head to toe. You're not embodying a fear, a stress, and an anxiety that's there based on a religious perspective to kind of manipulate you or to get you to do something. Isn't it funny? We may think that we buy into that and think, oh, how lovely. We've been told by sermon after sermon, preacher after preacher, pastor after pastor, priest after priest, whatever it may be, that if you you don't do this, you'll burn in hell. And we think, oh, that's a lovely spiritual truth, a great message of God. We love to hear this kind of stuff. How many of you would love it if you went on a a date with that wonderful dreamboat person that you were uh, thinking of in your life and they... uh, meet you at the date and they kind of hold a gun to your head and said, you're going to love me or else. And if you don't, uh, here's your punishment, you know. I mean, would we like that and think that's a great thing, you know? Yet somehow we think, oh, we serve this kind of God that says, yes, if you're not doing what I say, if you don't bow, you'll burn. If you don't do this, uh, you're going to be punished. There's all this, the intention of the worst case scenarios in our life. So we've grown up in a world that from our very spiritual basis has embodied a fear in our lives saying you need to be afraid oh people say now pastor wait a minute isn't there a scripture that says we need to fear the lord our god isn't there the very context of that is respect it's not to be afraid it's not to be frightened of the invitation is not that god is there to punish and god is out there to manipulate you in some way to get you to do things but an invitation to great love The practicality, the positive essence of spirituality is found in this wonderful goodness that's available to you to experience. And you need not be manipulated through fear. You need not be coerced by some sort of message that would embody a grounding or a founding of our spiritual consciousness that says, I must think the worst and live from that perspective at all times. You know, when Jesus was traveling this world and he taught, one of the things that his disciples uh, experienced was his faith. And they took on the very same faith as Jesus. They listened to his teaching. He taught them. He showed them how it works, in other words. He taught them, said, this is how your spiritual life becomes vibrant and real and it works for you. This is how you become that vital person that is living this abundant life. But as the years passed, the followers became more and more immersed in rules, rituals, and the organization of the church. Interesting, Jesus didn't come to create a church, didn't write a book, didn't try to create a denomination or movement, but he was about a way of living. And as time went on, we kind of slipped about, slipped away from the way of living And what happened in church history is we became more about rituals, rules, denominational uh, thinking, uh, things that separated us, uh, the organization of the church. And we stopped preaching, as we look through church history, we stopped preaching the necessity of having your own living faith. Instead, all the stories we told about Jesus were just simply to be a proof of his divinity. And so we read these stories and we said, oh, that's great. Jesus is the revelation of God. He's divine. But what does that have to do with me? How do I connect? Oh, Jesus does miracles. I can't do miracles. Jesus healed. I can't heal. Jesus did amazing things and manifested wonderful ways of compassion. I can't. You see, we've moved away from understanding that there is a faith that we are called to live, you know, that is living alive. And Jesus was the great teacher of this great faith, calling us to embody it as well. What happened is people stopped believing in that same power, the very power that Jesus was, at, that Jesus demonstrated. And there became a belief then that we become powerless. That's right. Many people believe I am powerless and I go to God and I expect God to do everything for me and don't realizing that the same power that dwelled in Jesus is the same power that dwells in you. And scriptures echo that over and over again, trying to get this message across to us that we need not be in fear. We need not live 
in this kind of lifestyle of anxiety and stress and welcoming it part of our lives, but that we embrace this fearless living. Hey, Jesus lived fearlessly, didn't he? Do we ever see any moments where Jesus expressed fear, where Jesus was stressed out or full of anxiety, worried or terrified by what was happening within his life, but he lived from this confidence of knowing that the power and presence of God alive within him was at work. And so we're called to do the very same. But often, because we have embodied the voices of the world around us and the consciousness of the way people think, we're living now only by appearances. And what holds us back in our great faith life is that the appearance. We keep looking and saying, I'd like to believe for something great, but... Look at my appearances. Look at where I am. I'm limited, or I don't have capabilities, or I don't have a lot of resources. And we look at all the things of life and say, I'm limited by the appearances of everything around me. A lot of people will say, I'm limited by my paycheck. You know, I live by that. And I want to tell you this, you have the, I'm inviting you to live beyond that. Knowing that you are open to the very gifts of God, the generosity of God. It's not your paycheck that defines who you are, what you are, what your capabilities are, or, or even your finances. Just know that there is unlimited access, access to the goodness of God. It may come for you in something called unexpected income. How many of you have ever experienced unexpected income? Something coming to you and like, oh, I didn't expect it that way. Oh, uh, so are you limited? No, you're not. You're in a realm of being unlimited, that there's all kinds of ways for God's blessing to come to your life. But so many people say, oh, wait a minute, I only make this amount of money and I'm limited to that. And that's all I can live off of. That's the only way I'm going to operate. Now, in my own personal life, let me share your story. I, Robert and I moved into a new home and five days after moving into this house that we were excited about, the second floor air conditioning went out. So, thank God we have the first floor air conditioning unit that's working, and it's humming along just great, and we're trying to blow air up into the uh, second floor to kind of cool it so that we can sleep at night and go run some fans. And we've been trying to go over and over again with uh, thinking, like, how are we going to get this fixed? And having uh, one air conditioning company come by, and the man said, I'm too fat to climb up in your attic. And the other man says, I'm too old to go up there. So we're hopeless and helpless. <laughs> and <laughs> so we moved on to another air conditioning company, trying to find someone to come and help us. And get it fixed. And finally, the company that came uh, last said, I hate to tell you this, it's not able, we're not able to fix it. It's not fixable. You're going to have to have a new unit. They're just simply about $5,000. That's all. And so, you know, we can help you with that and get something put in right away, provided you've got the $5,000 to spend. Well, suddenly the wave comes to me and says, first thought, consciousness of this world and the appearances said, wait a minute, I don't have $5,000 right now. I, I, I'm limited is the first thought that comes to mind. I don't know how I'm going to make it. Uh, how are we going to do we'll, I guess we'll live without air conditioning. We'll just survive. We'll blow fans. We'll, you know, but knowing that it's also a heat pump, which is also going to do the heat in the winter, well, we'll figure out a way. You know, we'll build a campfire up there. We'll think of something. Uh, you know, we're creative. We're inventive. And then I said, stop. Wait a minute. I live in a world and a realm of unlimited possibilities. And then it was we remembered that at the time of the closing of the purchase of our home, our real estate agent at the last minute said, oh, wait a minute, before we put all the things that we're requesting in this closing, how about we ask the homeowner to buy a homeowner's warranty? Oh, I didn't even thought about that. Oh, it's just $500. And so we called the homeowner's warranty company and got, you know, this uh, wonderful automated system that says, yes, we'll call you back in six weeks, you know, <laughs> you know, one of those kind of things. And if you want our attention, push dial one, dial six, dial seven, go to extension number four. And yes, uh, you know, thank you for your claim, but, you know, we'll get back to you sometime. And this automated system that seemed like, oh, okay, that was hopeless. We kind of sat down and said, okay, are we resigned to the fact that we're just going to have to buy a new air conditioner because this homeowner's warranty isn't going to wait, wait, do I need to live by appearances? Do I need to live in the realm that's of limitation? Or do I believe that I have the very power, the faith to believe that all things are going to work together for good? 
Do I not believe in the generosity and the power and presence of God at work in my life? Well, yes, I do. So let's change our thinking. And the phone rings. That's the homeowner's warranty saying, oh, we're going to give you a brand new air conditioning unit. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you this, that we can live in a world that's all about appearances and it says, I can't afford it. I can't do it. I'm limited. It's not going to work. And I'm afraid. And now I'm full of anxiety and I'm full of stress. Or we can choose to live as our spirituality calls us to do, as Jesus set for us to do, that we live in the realm of unlimited possibilities and that there is no limitation to our lives. The choice is ours. We can choose whichever one. But quite often what happens is we hear the music playing and the music says bow down to limitation, bow down to this God of fear, bow down to this place of saying you need to be stressed and worried and concerned, bow down to this place where your life is now going to be limited and you're going to have a lot of hardships in your life. And that false God that we bow down to of fear, stress, and anxiety is then what rules our lives. Yet scripture says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other gods, right? So the one true God is the living God of generosity and blessing for our lives, who desires prosperity and all good for us, who is generous and ever willing to bestow to us the blessings in our life if we're willing to claim them, believe for them, trust in them. Too often we get swept away with the false gods, with the pressure of our fear-based society and our culture, right? And we want to buy into all this kind of stuff. And we become like those in the Bible story who hear the music playing and we bow down. It's like our whole faith life is tuned, tuned into radio station. Be one to fear. Be one to fear. Uh-huh, that may be your radio station that you're in and you're tuned to it and you're listening to it over again and you hear the music and your first response is to be afraid. Your first response is, I'm living from stress. Your first response is, I'm having all kinds of <sighs> anxiety and stress. I mean, how many of you say, I live with a lot of anxiety in our lives? We do, we do. Yes, let's be honest. It comes to us from time to time. So the key thing is we got to change our station. So let's get back to these Hebrew people. This wonderful story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we're here in this wonderful moment where the king is saying to them, what are you going to do? You're not going to bow down? You know you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And you're okay with that? You're okay with that? And here's the beautiful passage from Scripture. This is what they said to the king. There's no use to answer you concerning this matter. In other words, I don't even need to address this with you because there is a God whom we serve who is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and to deliver us out of your hand. Wow, that's a lot of cocky confidence, shall we say? A lot of like, I know that I know. A lot of assurance within their voice and their expressions. A lot of says, I have great faith. A lot of sense that I really believe this to be true and I live from that. Wow, what a story. But that's our story. That's the invitation for each and every one of us to come to this place that says, I'm not speaking to you, fear. Mm -hmm. Fear may talk to me, but I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you, fear. I'm not going to be afraid. Anxiety may come to me. Stress may come to me. And it may come into me in waves, but I'm not even going to carry on a conversation in my head with you. There's no need for me to even answer you. That's this Bible story coming alive, is stop having discussions with the fears in your head because we allow that mind chatter to come through us. And that fearlessness is a place where we should be, where we no longer even question the infinite blessings of God, the power of God to be at work within our lives. But when we're fearful, when we're full of stress and anxiety, what happens is we question everything. Here's the thing, I want to tell you this. Do you know that you were created to co-create with God? That's right. Each of us, let's look at the story in the book of Genesis. We're created, and, and the very command was go forth and create after your own kind. And we think that means go forth and have lots of babies. Oh, boy, that's not what it means at all. It means go forth and be that creative spirit that you were meant to be. Created in the likeness and the image the very essence, the DNA, the consciousness of God that is cr a creative power. And you are called to go into this world and create. But let me tell you this, one of the things that we can't do is when we're in fear and stress 
and anxiety, we can't create. We're having a hard time creating. We really have a difficult being creative when we're now saying, oh, there's a wall, there's a barrier, there's something I'm afraid of, there's something that's keeping me from moving forward, I'll never make it. I'm stuck, right? So when we're at that place where we're saying, you know, I am so frightened and I'm full of anxiety and fear, we can't be exactly what we're called to be. We can't create when we're in this place of this fear. Because what happens in our minds is this. You know how creative things work? This scripture tells us this. The Bible, this is beautiful. It explains everything for us. Is this. Intellect, knowing, and our feeling come together. Model is male and female. The very masculine energy of knowing and understanding of intellect. When we grasp that and we mix it with these wonderful emotions of feeling, that means I know this promise of God and I mix it with this wonderful feeling within my heart and life that I know and I believe that God's at work within me. When I put those two together, there's something creative that happens within us. But when our emotions are fear-based and stressed, they're not at work at their highest and best. And then our intellect and our thought begins to question and wonder. And we go, I don't know, I, I, I I, I'm wondering, it's not even possible. And what happens is we lack the confidence. So the question was, how do I eliminate these things? It's walking in the power of a confidence that we embrace in our lives. Jesus spoke to a Roman centurion who had come to him and said, my beloved son, my slave, that one that I care for, that I'm intimately involved with. Uh, I love him dearly. He's very sick. And he comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, you just speak the word. You don't need to come to my house. You don't need to walk over here. You don't need to come the distance. You just speak the word, and I know that there will be a healing, and I know he'll be better. Wow. Such immense confidence. Faith that eliminates fear is confident faith. It's a faith that says, I know, and I'm assured, and I walk in that wonderful confidence. And I believe, and I have a strong belief in the greater good unfolding than a belief in the worst case scenario unfolding. Now, mind you, a lot of our spiritual life is based on traditions that say, just remember, the worst case is available to you. The worst case may fall on you. The worst case is coming to you. And so we kind of lean towards that where all of Jesus' teaching is inviting us to say, lean towards the best case scenarios for you. Live from that perspective. So we're living and saying, your air conditioning unit breaks down, hallelujah, I'm getting a new one, should be the consciousness. Not, oh, my air conditioning breaks down, and oh, there's no way, I guess I'm going to live. This is a hot, hot summer, and it ain't going to work for me. When we walk in saying, I know the highest and best is more available. And you're leaning towards the highest and best in your life. Because what's holding us back is this sort of uh, inability to connect with the affirmative side. Okay? The positive side. Right? Because naturally in our societies, we kind of lean towards the negative side of life. We learn to lean towards everybody talking the negative stuff. This ain't going to work. This is horrible. Life is bad. You know, we think it's kind of cute sometimes to talk about how horrible our life is, the Rodney Danger fields of our life when we kind of humorously joke and say, my wife is so bad, boom, boom, she's, you know, some joke that we had to make, or my life is this, it's the pits, or I'm so horrible. And, you know, we kind of love this self-deprecating humor, but in the, so in the journey of life, we kind of speak a lot of negativity, and we lean towards that. It's kind of like we hear the music playing and we bow to fear, negativity, and stress. So really the key is that we are now connecting with the more affirmative, the power of good. How do you do that? Okay, I want to help you with this. As your pastor, I really want to help you with this. And I want you to pay attention to say, here's some key things to help you along the way. One is, are you doing daily affirmations? You know? Speaking out affirmations of positive good. Every day we need to do this within our life. What does it do? It helps to train our thinking in the affirmative and connect to the positive power and presence of God. The presence of God is not negative power, by the way. So if you really want to connect with the presence of God, you connect with something that's affirming the good. So you look for these wonderful affirmations that can be, I believe that God is at work in my life. Now, that's a beautiful affirming statement. I believe that all good is coming to me. I believe that I walk in the realm of blessing. 
These wonderful affirmations that you may find either uh, written out by yourself or someone else are such power for your life because they help to set your thoughts in the right direction. Because the question is, how do I eliminate this fear? Well, you're going to eliminate this fear by replacing this consciousness of fear with a consciousness of the affirmative, of the power and the present and the good. Then we want you to really understand the power of meditating, of being in silence. Because so much of our fear-based life, we're going to offer these kind of prayers that we're constantly praying in stress and fear. God, you got to do this. God, are you listening? God, I'm up there. I'm screaming, knocking on your door. God, 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 God. You're not, I don't think you're really paying attention to me because I'm so stressed out and I'm worried and I'm frightened. Scripture says, be still, quiet. And in the stillness, you'll know God. And you'll find and discover some of these wonderful, powerful answers that you're searching for. Mantras are another thing. A lot of people may have a mantra that they speak out uh, in their day-to-day -day journey. I know I can, I know I can, I know I can. Wow, that's a simple mantra right there. God is at work, God is at work, God is at work. That may be a mantra for you that you hold on that helps you really affirm and your consciousness now is in that working in that positive. And if you're having still trouble, I'm gonna tell you this, do something wonderful, phone a friend. Mm -hmm. That's right. When you're out there in your last lifeline and you're playing the game of how to win a million in life and it's how to win the million of some great possibilities of life, phone a friend. That's right. Call someone and say, I want to visit with you about the goodness of God. Let's talk about the positive stuff. Next, find fellowship with people of like mind. Because if you're not finding people around you, surrounding yourself with people who lift you up spiritually, lift you up in a mindset, lift you up in a consciousness, lift you up in this faith that you can believe for all things, you will, you, you will remain in that fear-based, stress-filled, anxiety world that you're trying to leave. And how powerful it is when we embrace these things because what happens is that you are now using these things to treat your doubt. Now we've talked about this several times. Why do you pray? We pray because we're afraid. We pray because we doubt. We don't pray because we know. We don't pray because we're confident, we're assured. We go to God and say, oh, uh, my, my mother's sick. Would you pray for, because I'm, I, I just don't know what's gonna happen to, but we difference. We say, oh, folks, you don't need to pray. She's already know she's healed, you see. But because we don't believe, and we have doubt and questions and wondering, we seek out people to join with us in prayer. And what we actually want to do in prayer is to treat, remove, get rid of that kind of doubt and fear that comes to us. And we do this until we're completely convinced that the answer is already there because the answer is there. God is the God of the universe. And everything that we so desire within our world and our life is already there. So, but we have to open our hearts to the power of believing in a fearless way. So we pray and we treat with affirmation and the power of I know that I know God is good and I claim and I affirm and I speak these things and I begin to express the power of my believing in the prayer until one day I've got this kind of confidence that enables me then to have faith that's strong enough that I can practice it. Wow, practice. Are we going to practice? Yes, practice. Practice makes perfect, they say. And I know when I was a young piano student, my mother would say that over and over again, so yeah, over my shoulder. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. Keep going over, going over, going over. Keep playing it, keep playing it, keep playing it until you get it, until it becomes so natural for us. So I'm going to ask you this. If we're meant to live a life of faith, that's what Jesus was talking about, a life of faith, a life that says, I believe, and my faith is at work, and it's living, and it's live, and it's working. Practice it. So what have you done that really is a, a gesture of stepping out in faith? How have you practiced it? Now, a lot of people say, you know, I'm praying for a job. How are you stepping out in faith? Did you get dressed up? Did you get your interview clothes on? Do you have your resume in your hand? Are you driving out to places where there might be employment opportunities? Oh, no, no, well, it's just not going to work. I'm staying at home. I'm just going to, you know, live, watch TV today. Uh, you know, where's the faith that's practicing that says, today I believe I'm getting a job. I believe I'm, 
a miracle is happening for me. I believe I practice it. I believe it in such wonderful ways that it transforms our lives. Uh, I think it's so powerful that we begin to practice it and put it into action. Because what happens is people are moving away from churches who don't follow the very example Jesus set and practice what he taught. Now, here's a beautiful story that illustrates for us Jesus walking on the water. We all love that story, don't we? Jesus had spent some time in meditation. If you read the chapters, you're going to find he came from a moment of great prayer, a great time of being uh, away with God, away from the rest of the disciples, getting this wonderful spiritual refreshing and renewing within him. And now the disciples are out on the boat, out on the waters of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus comes walking out on the water. And in this story, the invitation is that Jesus speaks to those in the boat and said, I'm walking on water. Come walk on water with me. In other words, I'm setting the example of how your life is meant to be. Come, get out of your boat and walk on the water. Wait a minute. No, no, no. It's much safer to be in the boat because, well, we're afraid of the waters and we're afraid of the chaos and we're afraid of everything that's going around us. And we're afraid if we don't bow down to the idol, we'll sink. If we step out on the waters, which are choppy and we don't know how to walk on, we'll sink. You see, the stories correlate between Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego and the culture of that day and age that says, we're so afraid, we better just listen to the music and do what everybody else is doing. But in that boat, we're disciples. And Jesus said, I'm walking. Come walk. The invitation is, come on. Get out of the boat. Come walk on water with me. Come on, come on. And what happens is Peter says, all right, let's do it. I'm getting out of the boat. And he gets out of the boat and starts to walk on the water and follow the example of Jesus, right? Now, it's only when he begins to shift his mind and says, I am walking on water. I'm, I'm practicing faith. I'm stepping out and believing. This is scary stuff. This is really frightening. People don't do this normally. And here I am, and suddenly he begins to sink because he takes his eyes off of the very essence that Jesus was providing, and that's an example of saying, as I do, so you can do. Jesus said, greater things than this shall ye do is with an expectation that I'm setting forth the example for you. Get out of a boat. So the story is, if you want to eliminate all this stress, fear, and anxiety in your life, get out of the boat. Start practicing faith. Start practicing the power of believing that says, I have nothing to be afraid of. I have nothing to be stressed about. I have nothing to walk in anxiety about. Jesus told the disciples in that moment, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Take courage, it is I, do as I'm doing. Because you don't have to be afraid in the waters. You can step out. The miracle of walking in water was not left just to Jesus, but it's the invitation for you and I to do the very same, that you just have to get out of the boat and you have to start practicing, practicing, practicing. Now, how many of you are ready to walk across your swimming pool this week? Or <laughs> at least try it in the bathtub first. Uh, see how good you are. I laugh because it's a metaphor for us, a metaphor of this powerful story that the chaos of this world is all around us like a choppy sea. And Jesus is inviting you to walk above it. Walk above it. You may say, oh, it's safer to stay in the boat with all the others. It's safe to stay there. But you never experience the miraculous. You'll never experience the abundant life that you're called to live. You'll never experience this exhilarating, exciting faith. You'll never experience the joy that you're called to live out in a spiritual life with God that is an adventure. That's right. It's about time for us to have some adventurous spiritual life because what happens is we're just thinking, oh, spiritual life is just coming to church, saying a few prayers. It's boring. It's dull. It's not very exciting. Uh, why do we go to church? Because I'm going to tell you this. 
You go to church because it's the most adventurous invitation you can experience all week long. You go to experience that which might stimulate faith that you might have that, come to that place where you're practicing it every day. You're working on it. You're getting better at it. And you're coming to the place where you are just like Jesus. That's right. Walking in this world, walking above the waves and walking above the fear and the anxiety, walking above all that. And you've eliminated it. It's not even in your consciousness anymore because you've risen above it. What an amazing place to be. The invitation is ours. You don't need to stay in fear and anxiety and stress one more day. You don't need to do it. Not one more day. And when it comes to you, and it, it comes to us per- periodically in waves, and you know what? We have to deal with it. You know, I had, it comes at me constantly and I have to deal with the wave of fear, the wave of anxiety, the wave that comes against me that says, oh, here's a voice that says all things are impossible and you will never make it and this is too difficult and it's not going to work for you. It's never going to happen. You might as well give up. You might as well quit. And then you have to say, like Jesus, I need to get away. I need to shut the music off that's playing, inviting me to bow down to the gods of fear and the false gods around my world, and that I would buy into that craziness. And I don't care. They say, oh, but you're stepping on faith, and you know what? You could risk everything. That's right. It's the invitation to step out and enjoy that exhilarating experience of risking, you might say, but practicing your faith. Because if you don't practice anything, you never get good at it. And yes, you may say the first time, I tried to step out in faith and believe for something in a I fell a little bit flat on my face. Well, get back up and do it again. Get back up and practice it because practice does make perfect until we have built up such a confidence and a faith that we say, I know that I know that I believe that I believe that I trust that I trust that I have a complete confidence and assurance that Jesus, you just speak the word or that you just say it. It's that kind of faith that enables us to to eliminate the fear within our lives. So I want to ask you this. What if your faith, your life was so filled with faith that you were fearless? What would that look like? What would it be like for you? It's possible. The invitation is yours. Amen.